People don't understand how ignorant this is because all they've ever heard is divorce is wrong, God hates divorce, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. But I'm telling you, God hates you going to hell and God hates him being robbed of the glory that he deserves to have from your life far more than he hates you divorcing a person who is evil or divorcing yourself from everything in your life that is darkness. At what point does your staying in a marriage where a person is evil become a violation of the first greatest commandment? Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second one is like it. Loving your neighbor as yourself. When you pervert and twist that and you put loving someone else above loving God, it's a complete collapse of the truth and it's a perversion. True story, just received this email two weeks ago from a woman who her church had convinced her and convinced her and convinced her she had no choice but to stay with her unequally yoked husband who was absolute evil, who railed against her faith in God. She stayed with him 21 years until she was absolutely dead in her spirit. She was a shell of a human being and her out of her own mouth she testifies, I've lost my relationship with Jesus and I'm pretty confident I've lost my salvation. God is now using me exactly as you speak in your videos. He's using me as evil in the lives of other people. She didn't get out soon enough. She thought for sure, if I just keep staying, if I just keep fighting, she told herself and justified herself right to a path of death. My wife and I hear no shortage of terrifyingly sad, tragic, devastating stories of people primarily in marriages who have yoked themselves together with an unbeliever either in their own ignorance of God's ways years ago and then they finally became a Christ follower or many chose to put themselves in this situation hoping that the unbeliever would eventually come and that they could be won over to Christ and now five years, ten years, fifteen years later they're discovering they have an absolute disaster on their hands. And because the teaching on divorce has been so perverted, it's been pounded into the hearts and minds of every Christian, and particularly in, in the West, that divorce is evil, God hates divorce, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. I have shown throughout many different scriptures that is only one wing on the bird, and that that good scripture has been taken entirely out of proportion, has now been perverted to the point where marriage, or let's say avoiding divorce, has become an altar that is even more important than a godly relationship with God. It's even more important than holiness. It's now become even more important than faithfulness. It's become more important than a pure heart. The church has taught that above all things, we must protect the marriage. And the church is forcing down the people's throats. I believe it's an absolute perversion by the devil. The devil takes everything God calls good. He twists it, perverts it, over-tightens it. And I believe that's exactly what's happened in divorce. I've spoken a lot on this message. This is not that message. I'm just trying to make it clear that there is absolutely a time to separate even in marriage. There are multiple scriptures I've already included in other messages where God himself basically condemns and judges the Israelites for marrying foreigners. We see in Ezra chapter 10, God calls the biggest divorce in human history. Why does the God who hate divorce so much call for a divorce? Because God is more interested in one person being pure and wholly devoted to him, walking in the light, than he is in allowing that person to marry a person who he knows is not going to walk in God's ways, thereby corrupting the one child of his that he already has drawing to himself. There's a Machiavellian principle, I believe it was, that was divide and conquer. And I see more and more it is true, as Tozer so eloquently said, Satan knows the exact opposite strategy. Satan knows how to unite and conquer. The scriptures are replete in the New Covenant that a God-fearing Christian needs to separate from darkness and the disobedient, in particular those who call themselves Christ followers but live outside of it. But there is a, an absolute death trap that I'm seeing more and more where people believe 
they can walk in the light, living with a partner who's walking in darkness. In 1 Corinthians 7.15, people must understand it speaks of the willingness of the unbeliever to live with the believing spouse. And upon doing so, Paul says, do not divorce. He mentions it twice. He says, wife, if your unbelieving husband is willing to live, do not divorce him. Husband, if your unbelieving wife is willing to live with you, do not divorce. We have to revisit what it means willing. When you begin to really take God seriously, laying your life down, sacrifice, surrender, your whole life is going to change. It has to change. You have to be entirely different than the unbelieving spouse you're with. And when that unbelieving spouse is living in lifestyles and behaviors that are opening the door to the devil, how in the world do you think that father is going to say to one of his beloved children, it is okay. Not that you're living with an unbelieving spouse who's a decent, law-abiding, upstanding, drug-free person who's actually contributing in life and who just hasn't had the light on the gospel yet. But what we're getting emails about is from people who are living with people who are not just unbelievers, they are actually evil. And the Bible makes it very clear that you cannot participate at the table of God and at the table of demons. And there's some scriptures I want to talk about. The Bible makes it so clear that you must flee darkness. People want to send us these emails and ask, what do I do in this situation? I'll tell you what you need to do in this situation. You have to flee all darkness in your life. No matter where your suffering is coming from, ask yourself this, what darkness do you have in your life, regardless of whether it's coming from your spouse or from your child? What door is in your life that darkness is constantly coming and stepping in front of you on. Whatever it is, God says it has to go. There's no other way. And if what I'm saying sounds radical to you, then keep doing what you're doing and you're going to keep getting what you've got. You're going to find that God is not going to bless you. You're going to find your Christianity is my selfianity. It's going to be entirely up to you. The grace of God will not be with you because you're trying to yoke yourself in the name of love, in the name of marriage, in the name of financial security, I can't tell you how disgusting it is how many women we get emails from that are considering leaving the partner, confused about if they should stay with this evil person, but guess what? One common thread is always in the emails. Money. I would leave, but... And it always has something to do with money, which means that deceived Christian woman is serving money rather than God. And so what does she do? For the sake of money, which is already God's number one biggest competitor, I'm going to stay in the darkness, which is the opposite of God. People don't understand how ignorant this is because all they've ever heard is divorce is wrong, God hates divorce, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. But I'm telling you, God hates you going to hell and God hates him being robbed of the glory that he deserves to have from your life far more than he hates you divorcing a person who is evil or divorcing yourself from everything in your life that is darkness. Luke eleven thirty four 34 through 36, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But when they are bad, your body also is full of darkness. See to it then. You have to choose that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be completely lighted as when the light of a lamp shines on you. You cannot go to heaven if you're living and walking in darkness and if you have bad spiritual eyes. This is a call for us to see the light in our life, to avoid the darkness by having good spiritual eyes. We have to see to it. When we embrace a television show, when we embrace an addiction, when we embrace a friendship, when we embrace an evil, unbelieving spouse, we are inviting darkness into our life. John 3, 19 through 21, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. I wonder how many people in these unequally yoked marriages God could look at and accuse them and say, you loved the dark rather than the light. And you use the excuse of divorce to stay in the darkness. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly 
that what he has done has been done through God. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Here's a verse that doesn't apply to any Christian who's married in an unequally yoked marriage. You can just rip this one right out of your Bible. That's what it seems like people believe. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Business relationships, intimate friendships, marriage. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? If your spouse is living in darkness, what fellowship can you have with them if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ? And if you're walking and the Spirit of Christ is in you, and yet daily you're subjecting the light of Christ in you to the darkness in your partner, how are we to expect to feel the warm and fuzzy from God? How are we to expect God to feel safe in the home He purchased you with the blood of Christ when you consistently are yoking yourself to dark television shows, dark relationships, dark habits, dark websites, dark Facebook posts, dark this, whatever. And then we wonder, why don't we feel God's presence? Why doesn't God speak to me? We wonder why then we have to contact men and see, does a man have a word for me? People contact me now and they say, do you have a word for me? The reason why God doesn't have a word for you directly is because you've yoked yourself to darkness. You're ignorant. You think you're doing this in love, but you've reversed the first and second commandment. At what point does your staying in a marriage where a person is evil become a violation of the first greatest commandment? Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second one is like it. Loving your neighbor as yourself. When you pervert and twist that and you put loving someone else above loving God, it's a complete collapse of the truth and it's a perversion. What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? And the unbeliever doesn't care anything about your relationship with God. They accuse you, they mock you, they bring all kinds of filthy habits into your home, and then you wonder why your relationship with God is slowly deteriorating. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be their people, therefore. That means everything I just said, this next statement is dependent upon. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you, comma, unless you are married, because remember, God hates divorce. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. But you know something? What's the opposite of this? If you touch unclean things, and if you flirt with the darkness, if you tolerate the darkness... My friend, you can think this is a radical message all day long. You can find another message who will preach to you a little softer message, a little more tolerance, somebody who will perhaps say this is unloving. And here's how you can absolutely 100% know that what I'm telling you in interpretation of the Scripture is true in heaven. Because you will continue on the road you're on. Your relationship with God will continue to deteriorate. And you're going to need to listen to message after message after message after message after message, read book after book after book to try to console you in your pain and to try to feed you false hope that one day this person is going to change and come to the Lord. That one day all this evil and mockery is going to turn around for God's good. Now listen, can God save an unbeliever? Yes. But in our ignorance, we yoke ourselves to a person who is unwilling to live with us We embrace and hug and sleep with the darkness right next to us every night. And then we wonder, why do I not feel the warm fuzzies from Father? Why does my life feel so chaotic? Why do I have no peace and no joy? You're never going to have it until you give up the darkness that you're trusting in. Do you know that at some point I read women's emails to me primarily? And I hear them speak of the desire and the need to stay in the relationship so much. And it's like God showed me one time. They're in violation of Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. They're under the curse of trusting in man. I want to challenge you if you hear this message. At what point are you, for the sake of listening to that legalistic, ignorant minister who's told you a thousand times, God hates divorce, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. 
at the expense of your holiness, at the expense of your sanity, and at the expense of God's glory. How many times have you ever wondered if you might be under the curse of Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8, trusting in man rather than in God? At what point does your desire to stay in this marriage have more to do with your money and your comfort and your security? It's like my wife asked one time after we listened to one of these messages. I wonder if that lady would stay with that husband that she wants to stay with so much if he became homeless tomorrow and lost everything. She claims that she wants to stay with him now because she wants to love Jesus and she knows that she needs to be persecuted for her faith and that we all have to suffer. But would she feel the same way if her husband lost everything and became homeless? Would she still want to love him like Jesus? Would she still want to give herself and suffer for him at that situation? I think we know the answer to that question. It shows a hypocrisy. It shows that women are primarily trusting in money. And so they're willing to stay in the relationship. Now, are you going to tell me that that's less evil than getting a divorce for the sake of God separating from the darkness and saying to God, I made a mistake. I got in a marriage I shouldn't have gotten in, Lord. I did like David and Bathsheba. Lord, you didn't put that marriage together. They did. God did not put the marriage together with Bathsheba. This was born of David's choice, David's sin. David's resources. We're all guilty of living in ignorance and we choose life partners and careers and children and all kinds of things outside of God's will. And then when it begins to afflict us and hurt us, we reap what we sow. We cry out, God, I don't understand. I want to keep everything that I have in my life, but I need your blessing and I need your joy. It'll never happen. And if you don't believe me, keep on exactly the track you're on and three years from now, keep this recording somewhere and you can listen to it and you say, my goodness, Michael's interpretation of the word is right. Or you can wait 21 years, like a lady I'll call Linda. That's not her name. True story. Just received this email two weeks ago from a woman who her church had convinced her and convinced her and convinced her she had no choice but to stay with her unequally yoked husband who was absolute evil, who railed against her faith in God. She stayed with him 21 years until she was absolutely dead in her spirit. She was a shell of a human being, and her out of her own mouth she testifies, I've lost my relationship with Jesus, and I'm pretty confident I've lost my salvation. God is now using me exactly as you speak in your videos. He's using me as evil in the lives of other people. She didn't get out soon enough. She thought for sure, if I just keep staying, if I just keep fighting, she told herself and justified herself right to a path of death. John 12, 46 through 48. I have come into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness, except, of course, if you're married to an unbelieving spouse who does evil. As for the person who hears my words but who does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world but to save it. Watch this. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my word. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. My friend, my sister, my brother, do you have the light of life? Jesus promises it. Do you have the light of life yoking yourself to all the darkness? Do you call yourself a Christian and then live? Are you not willing to give up the darkness? Do you love the darkness in your spouse more than you love the light in Jesus Christ? This is serious. Ephesians 5, 3 through 14. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people set apart. Unless, of course, you're unequally yoked to an unbelieving evil spouse. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. God hates divorce. God hates divorce. God hates divorce. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. 
Unless, of course, you're married to an unbelieving evil spouse. For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord, even though you spend your days with a person who invites evil and who mocks light and good. Is that, I mean, you need to add what you believe as the reality in your life to the Word of Scripture and see that it doesn't match up. For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Unless, of course, you're married to an unbelieving spouse who does this. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is the light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Christ will shine His light on you, but not if you continue to yoke yourself to darkness. Not if you think you know better than God. 1 Peter 2.9 You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praise of Him who called you out of the darkness and into the light. 1 John 1, 5-7, This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, Yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. And listen to this. But if we walk in the light, which is impossible to do so, when you're living with a person who embraces evil and openly mocks the goodness of God in your life, it is impossible. There's no way God can be pleased. How can you show me in the Old Covenant where God orders the biggest divorce in human history in Ezra chapter 10, where He screams at the Israelites in Numbers and in Deuteronomy telling them that even if your wife that you love tells you we shall go after foreign gods, you should stone her to death. This is what the Scriptures tell us. There are warning after warning after warning about God warning them, do not marry a foreign woman or a foreign person who will lead you astray to other gods. My friend, if you're living with an unequally yoked person who loves the darkness and who's all about the world, their very presence in your life is dedicated to try to pull you away to what? Worship another god called the god of the world, the god of football, the god of money, the god of entertainment, the god of false religion, whatever it is. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. My friend, I don't know how you can read this scripture and think you can yoke yourself to darkness and walk with it and live with it every day and then expect Jesus to purify you from all sin. I think your heart is revealing to you the truth of what I'm saying. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, come to me. He says, I will give you water to drink in John 4, 13 through 14, that you will never thirst again. It will well up inside of you and become a spring of water leading to well of life. Jesus also said that anyone who believes in him, out of him will flow rivers of living water. Do you have rivers of living water in the situation you're in? Or have you become a hypocritical martyr for the sake of your own security or for the fear of what other people will think or because legalism lion, error in the church has cut your legs out from underneath of you and paralyzed you. You're so afraid. You made a mistake. You don't want to be shamed. You don't know how you're going to take care of yourself. So don't trust God and get out of the darkness and into the light. Just stay where you're at and live on the strategy of false hope that one day God is going to magically zap this person who's lived their whole life heart-hearted evil. The Bible says the wicked go astray from birth. The Bible says in Luke 8, 15, the seed that fell on good soil stands for those who with a noble and good heart. Hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. But never mind, you just stay with that hard-hearted person there and see what kind of result you get. How is your life a reflection of any of the promises that Jesus Christ promised in your life and heart? Do you have the rest and the peace 
the free of worry, the free of anxiety, the freedom from sin, the freedom over your anger? Do you have that sense of peace that surpasses all understanding, fruitfulness, answered prayers, the joy of Christ made complete? Could anybody look into your life and marriage and say that out of you is flowing rivers of living water? And if you say to me, no, then can you show me in Scripture where that is the exception? A dead marriage that you're in, that, that, that you being married to an unequally yoked unbeliever, that that's the exception that Jesus says, oh, oh, you shouldn't expect to have rivers of living water as a believer because you're in a really difficult, unbelieving situation. Is that what Jesus taught? That somehow or another there's a different standard for you? You shouldn't expect these things? The answer is no. You're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. But mark this, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, there will be terrible times in the last days. Think of your unbelieving spouse and tell me this doesn't apply. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them, comma, except if you're married. Does it say that in Scripture? My friend, I've been hard in sharing this word with you because I get so many emails from people who want to tell me about all the details of tragedy in their life that are a result of one thing and one thing only, Sin and darkness. People have yoked themselves to darkness. They've made foolish choices. And then they want to take my time up to tell me about these things as if somehow or another I can do anything for them except for to say this. Nothing is going to change. Let me repeat it. Nothing is going to change until you leave the darkness. No matter what form it is. If it's a computer screen... Jesus said, cut it off and throw it out of your life. If it's a television show, cut it out and throw it off. If it is a person, if Jesus tells you to cut off your eyeball and rip it out, cut off your hand and, 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 and cut off your right foot, if it's causing you to sin, telling you that it's better for you to enter life maimed than to have all of your appendages and be thrown into a burning hell, how much more would he say to you if you're spouse is causing you to sin cut it off and throw it away after all there's millions of divorces around the world there's millions of stories of believing spouses or unbelieving spouses leaving have you ever in your life heard of a person pulling their eye out because they they sinned have you ever in your life heard of somebody cutting off their leg cutting off their arm no and yet jesus says you need to deal so drastically with sin in your life and the darkness in your life that if anything in your life is causing you to sin, what does he say about little children? And he's not talking about just little kids. Woe to those who do anything to cause one of these little ones to stumble and to sin. It would be better for that person to have a millstone hung around their neck and thrown into the depths of the sea and drown. He's also speaking of young disciples. Young children, we're all children. Ephesians 5, 1, as dearly loved children. How much would the Father say that about your spouse who's causing you to sin, causing you to get angry, causing you to cheat, steal, hide, cover, whatever it is you maybe are doing to compromise your values with God because of an unbelieving spouse? My friend, this is so serious. I'm not an advocate for divorce. I'm an advocate for holiness. I'm an advocate for light. I'm an advocate for cutting off anything and anyone in your life. We don't live in the days that Jesus and the disciples did. We live in worse days than Jesus and the disciples did. That's the God's honest truth. That's what the Bible says. It's incredibly difficult to be a Christian these days. How can you ever expect to please God? How can you ever expect to be a part of the virgin bride of Christ that He's coming back for if you're living your life strapped to a dead body? Go read the scriptures. Look up dead in the New Covenant. Just look up the word dead and you'll see how God refers to every person that's an unbeliever, including you, including me, spiritually dead. Even saying that the, the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Calling false teachers twice dead. 
If in the Old Covenant the Bible commands us that we shall not touch any unclean thing, including a dead body, and yet we're sleeping in God's eyes because everything is spiritual in the New Covenant, we're sleeping every single night with a dead person in our house, in our bed, spiritually dead. It's like my wife said, if you were to lay a dead corpse in your bed and sleep next to it, would you expect to do anything less than to inherit its diseases? You would eventually die. Maybe two weeks after sleeping with a dead body, as it continues to get more and more filth and sickness and darkness and disease and infirmity, you, you would get it just simply from being exposed to the dead body. Do you know something? That's exactly what's happening to Christians all over the world, but these ridiculous, ignorant, legalistic pastors, these children of the devil, I'll call them the same thing that Jesus Christ called them, tells you, God hates divorce, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. You know who's telling you that, my friend? The devil. The devil's the one that's telling you that. You know why? Because he knows if he can just get you to sleep with that dead body enough more nights, eventually you are going to end up dead too. You don't believe me? Just keep sleeping with the darkness and ask yourself, is your relationship with Christ getting more vibrant, more powerful, more robust? Are you getting more light? Are you feeling the Holy Spirit work with you more, come closer to you? Or do you see day after day death? And are you surviving from book to book and message to message? Are you having to run to man and to girlfriends or maybe to me? Are you having to just keep running to people and running to music and running to food and ice cream? Look at all the things I'm sure you're running to to try to find comfort. Is that the life of a Christ follower? Is God blessing you? There's enough to suffer in this life apart from yoking yourself to darkness and walking intentionally in sin. Cut it out of your life and you will see the light of life. My friend, I'm making this message right now from Hyderabad, India. Divorce is something that you rarely ever hear about in India. It is so looked down upon. It is one of the greatest quote-unquote sins that you can do. They get married and they stay married no matter what their spouse treats them like or does. They look down on us Westerners because we have so much divorce. They don't divorce. They just live miserable or in multiple affairs. Whatever it takes to give them a little sense of satisfaction in this life. How are you any better than a society that is filled with pagans who place such unbelievable importance on the institution of marriage, how are you any better? Will God reward them when they get to heaven? And stand before their maker, will he say to them, I am going to reward you because you stayed married. I just want you to see the ridiculousness of making a marriage more important than holiness and following the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully and with an absolute full surrender to His will in your life, not yours. If you continue to live with a dead body, you are going to absolutely be guaranteed to inherit all of its diseases, spiritually speaking, and eventually spiritual death. We hear all the time, God hates divorce, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. That is a one-winged bird, and it flies in circles. How often we have we heard, God hates unequally yoked marriage. God hates unequally yoked marriage. If you read the full Bible, which Paul tells to Timothy, you have known the Scriptures from your youth. They are able to make you wise for salvation. What are the Scriptures? The Old Testament. That's the only Scriptures there were. Read Deuteronomy chapter 7, 3 through 6. Read Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 9. And read Nehemiah 13, 26 through 27. And then read Ezra chapter 10, verses 2 through 11. And see the other wing on this bird that God despises intermarriage where we have yoked ourselves to somebody that is not 
walking in His ways and in His light and by His Spirit. As the Bible says, they have made alliances, but not by my Spirit. Is your marriage an alliance by God's Spirit? If it's not, then God does not like it. He hates it because it's removing His ability to receive glory from you. So ask yourself this question. You know, you're saying, Mike, are you saying I should just up and leave? I don't know. You need to ask the Father that. If you're living with somebody who gives you the freedom, and as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, they're willing to live with you, and that means they're not smoking pot, doing drugs, watching pornography, putting you up against the wall with your hand around your neck, mocking you as you try to worship God, causing you all kinds of heartache and pain that prevents you from having the freedom to worship God as you see fit, I think it's very likely you need to leave them. I am not an advocate for divorce for no reason. If you're married to a nice person who doesn't know the Lord, but they're they're a a responsible, productive citizen of society and in your life and in your family, I'm not saying they have to be perfect, but overall, they're a decent human being. There's all kinds of unbelievers everywhere in the world who are decent human beings. If they're a decent human being, don't leave them. Don't just try to trade out of the marriage for somebody else. I am only making this message, and I've only made it this hard and this passionate because of the unbelievable volume of emails I receive from women who, in particular, and men, who are in these terribly unequally yoked marriages, and they have been brainwashed that once they've got themselves in this trap, They can never get out. My friend, ask yourself this question. Is the marriage that you're in, if it were a tug of war, here's how you can know if you need to get out of this marriage or not. Think of it as a tug of war. You're on one side, pulling towards the light. They're on the other side, pulling towards the dark. Which way is the rope going? If the answer to that question is that if you look at your relationship with God and you see that there's more light behind you than there is in front of you and you're being pulled more and more to the dark, my friend, God would have you get out of this marriage. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Don't go talk to some man. Don't go sit and consult. Consult the Father. Don't go trusting in man. And don't go asking some man who preaches at your church who has a seminary degree and all he's ever been taught by his denomination is God hates divorce. I wonder how many ministers preach the God hates divorce message so much because they are an absolute abomination of a husband in the eyes of God and in the eyes of their spouse, and they're preaching that message so that their spouse won't leave them. You can't imagine all the stories I've received from women who married, quote, ministers. I just received one today. Just today, a pastor's wife, she reaches out to me. My friend, I don't want to go on and on and on about this. I just want you to see that there is a good reason for you to separate. May God help you and give you the wisdom. If you're leaving a marriage because you just want to marry somebody else or you want a little more of this or they're not so nice to you anymore or whatever, I say, God, shame on you. But if you want to exit a dark relationship so that you can find Christ, I tell you, that's a relationship move that God himself will indeed honor. People don't understand how ignorant this is because all they've ever heard is divorce is wrong, God hates divorce, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. But I'm telling you, God hates you going to hell and God hates him being robbed of the glory that he deserves to have from your life far more than he hates you divorcing a person who is evil or divorcing yourself from everything in your life that is darkness. At what point does your staying in a marriage where a person is evil become a violation of the first greatest commandment? Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second one is like it. Loving your neighbor as yourself. When you pervert and twist that and you put loving someone else above loving God, it's a complete collapse of the truth and it's a perversion. True story. Just received this email two weeks ago from a woman. Sad tragic, devastating stories 
of people primarily in marriages who have yoked themselves together with an unbeliever, either in their own ignorance of God's ways years ago, and then they finally became a Christ follower, or many chose to put themselves in this situation, hoping that the unbeliever would eventually come and that they could be won over to Christ. And now, five years, 10 years, 15 years later, they're discovering they have an absolute disaster on their hands. And because the teaching on divorce has been so perverted, it's been pounded into the hearts and minds of every Christian, particularly in, in the West, that divorce is evil, God hates divorce, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. Who her church had convinced her and convinced her and convinced her she had no choice but to stay with her unequally yoked husband who was absolute evil, who railed against her faith in God. She stayed with him 21 years until she was absolutely dead in her spirit. She was a shell of a human being and her out of her own mouth she testifies, I've lost my relationship with Jesus and I'm pretty confident I've lost my salvation. God is now using me exactly as you speak in your videos. He's using me as evil in the lives of other people. She didn't get out soon enough. She thought for sure, if I just keep staying, if I just keep fighting, she told herself and justified herself right to a path of death. My wife and I hear no shortage of terrifyingly I have shown throughout many different scriptures that is only one wing on the bird and that that good scripture has been taken entirely out of proportion, has now been perverted to the point where marriage or let's say avoiding divorce has become an altar that is even more important than a godly relationship with God. It's even more important than holiness. It's now become even more important than faithfulness. It's become more important than a pure heart. The church has taught that above all things, we must protect the marriage. And the church is forcing down the people's throats. I believe it's an absolute perversion by the devil. The devil takes everything God calls good. He twists it, perverts it, over-tightens it. And I believe that's exactly what's happened in divorce. I've spoken a lot on this message. This is not that message. I'm just trying to make it clear that there is absolutely a time to separate even in marriage. There are multiple scriptures I've already included in other messages where God himself basically condemns and judges the Israelites for marrying foreigners. We see in Ezra chapter 10, God calls the biggest divorce in human history. Why does the God who hate divorce so much call for a divorce? Because God is more interested in one person being pure and wholly devoted to him, walking in the light, than he is in allowing that person to marry a person who he knows is not going to walk in God's ways, thereby corrupting the one child of his.